All right, so <clears throat> here we go with another recorded lecture. Uh, this is uh, in your book, chapter 37, uh, Vehicle Extrication and Special Rescue. Uh, this is a pretty short chapter, pretty easy um, chapter. Uh, just like I said, this uh, exam six is pretty much all operations, so it's not really medicine. It's basically just how we handle some specific situations as far as uh, the scene, maybe some hazardous material response, and in this case, of course, vehicle extrication, special rescue. So let's jump into it. We're going to skip this introduction slide. We're going to talk about it later on in this chapter. All right, safety, of course, uh, if we're dealing with vehicle extrication, which of course is the process of removing uh, people or persons out of the vehicle, usually um, due to some level of entrapment or um, extreme uh, damage to the vehicle that does not allow us to gain simple access to the patient. Uh, of course, we're dealing with broken glass, leaking fluids, the potential for fire or explosions, uh, the potential for noxious fumes, uh, a whole range of uh, things that can do us harm and the patient harm. And of course, <clears throat> We already know that our number one consideration for any scene, for any call, is our safety first and then our partner's safety. So we always want to enter these situations um, uh, having safety in the back of our minds, always always keeping, you know, as they say, two eyes in the back of your head just to make sure that uh, you're aware of the scene, you're aware of these potential hazards. But, of course, we have to um, wear or don the appropriate equipment to even protect us before we even get on scene. So extrication requires mental and physical uh, preparation. The priority is to provide patient care. Consider the safety of yourself and your team. Safety begins with the proper mindset and personal protective gear or PPE. Equipment and gear should be appropriate to the anticipated hazards. Okay, so of course, you're not going to start handling metal or sharp metal and whatever without gloves. You're not going to walk into a hazmat scene where there's noxious fumes or gases, right, without a respirator. Okay, so you kind of have to cater uh, your um, you kind of have to cater your PPE, your protective equipment, uh, to the specific scenario. This is a, this is a good example of pr protective gear. Okay, uh, as far as PPE, remember. The difference between standard precautions and PPE, standard precautions are to protect yourself primarily from uh, uh, medical issues. Uh, as far as if you're walking into somebody's house with a communicable disease like TB or uh, meningitis, your standard precautions would be um, uh, goggles or a face mask, um, uh, gloves, and... Um, Eyewear, if you are, excuse me, um, a surgical mask if you need, if you needed to, uh, 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 N95 respirator. Um, whereas personal protective equipment uh, goes beyond that, really. To it's kind of all inclusive. To maybe it's medical causes, maybe it's uh, OB, maybe it's trauma in cases of using uh, a gown or things that we typically wouldn't use on every single call. Uh, but for when we're talking about extrication, when we're dealing with tools and uh, dangerous scenes, uh, dangerous materials. Uh, we're more referring to things that keep you from getting injured. Like you see this firefighter has turnout gear on. Um, uh, that's to obviously protect from heat, protect from flames. Uh, it also is extremely thick and very durable to protect against sharp objects and things like that. You also notice that he's got, um, that he's got gloves on right here, okay. Those gloves are um, to protect from heat. And then he's got the, this outer pair of, of even more durable gloves. That's for handling uh, sharp objects or dangerous materials. So a couple different levels or layers of protection here that this guy's got on. Vehicle safety systems uh, can become hazards after a collision. A loaded bumper can release and injure you. Uh, these loaded bumpers basically are designed to um, uh, absorb the force of the impact. Uh, so, uh, say the front bumper was a loaded bumper, 
and you're driving along and then you rear end somebody, that bumper is going to compress and absorb that energy so that there is a minimal, as much, uh, as minimal as we can, um, uh, as, min as minimal as, excuse me, that bumper will reduce the amount of force that's applied to the actual vehicle itself. So of course, um, it is diminishing the amount of force that is in turn going to be exerted on uh, the vehicle and on uh, the people inside of the vehicle. So when these loaded bumpers do their job, when they absorb that, that force, uh, that's a good thing. However, when after the car accident, when you, we are walking around on scene, right, we might pass in front of the car and that loaded bumper may release and shoot back out. And of course, it could uh, fracture your femur, dislocate your leg, dislocate your knee, cause a bunch of different injuries, right? And now you're a patient as well. So uh, be aware of that. Airbags are incredibly important. Um, airbags uh, fill very quickly uh, with superheated gas uh, from the steering column and from the passenger dashboard. Of course, the purpose of the airbag is to uh, is to diminish deceleration injuries, right? It's uh, it basically um, it's basically a way to reduce the amount of force that's exerted on your body from a secondary collision. So, of course, uh, first collision is the vehicle strikes an immovable object or some other object. Okay, uh, a secondary collision is you as a person, your body strikes some sort of uh, structure or object inside of the vehicle uh, due to deceleration. Right. Of course, if you're uh, and when we talk about deceleration, your car is moving off, moving along at a constant velocity, hits some other object. Of course, that velocity is displaced and your body as the car is moving backwards, so to speak. Right. Displaced from that velocity, your body is going to move forward at a very fast rate. Uh, that's called deceleration. OK, <clears throat> the displacement of your body in the opposite direction that the vehicle is moving. Um, and the third collision is directly related to the severity of the second collision. So the second collision is when your body strikes uh, an object inside of the car, and then your organs inside of your body shift forward, okay, another form of deceleration, shift forward in the opposite direction now that your body is moving, and will strike uh, bony prominences like the rib cage, uh, like the skull, for the, if we were talking about the brain, uh, with the potential to cause major damage. Uh, that is the third collision. So first collision is external. Second, second collision is internal. If we were talking about the vehicle, your body moving forward inside of the vehicle. And uh, third collision is completely internal, referring to your vital organs inside of your body. Uh, so airbags, what they're trying to do is, yes, it, uh, you striking the airbag is a form of a second, secondary collision. Because your body is moving forward and striking an object, so to speak, the airbag. However, that airbag provides a cushion and it severely decreases um, the force of that deceleration injury. And of course, uh, like you can imagine, you would much much rather hit, have your body hit a big uh, padded balloon, basically, than hitting the steering column or striking the uh, the windshield. Okay. Uh, located in the steering wheel of the passenger dash, their deploy, non-deployed airbags pose a risk, therefore maintain an appropriate distance. Uh, use appropriate protective gear to reduce the risk of eye or lung irritation from the cornstarch or talc in airbags. Okay, so we'll talk about this one first. Okay, um, airbags are, they've saved many, many people's lives. Of course, uh, they're extremely useful. They, like you said, they, they help decrease the severity of those deceleration injuries. Um, however, a couple things you should know about airbags. Um, just because you strike an airbag doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to walk away from the accident with absolutely zero problems, uh, with no injuries, right? Of course, that massive deceleration, you're still striking an object, even though it is, in essence, a balloon, okay? Uh, you're still striking an object, so you have the potential for, I've seen people that, uh, I've heard of people that have had uh, even frontal skull fractures from hitting the airbag. 
saved their life, but they still walked away with some nasty injuries. I've seen uh, eye problems. I've seen uh, uh, fractures of the globe or uh, of the orbit, lacerations of the globe of the eye. I've seen broken noses, dislocated jaws, um, some uh, cervical spine problems, of course. Uh, if your if your head is going that far, that hard into um, that hard into the airbag, of course it has the potential to uh, hyperextend your neck and cause cervical da damage or spinal damage. Um, so a lot of times it will save patients' life, but if a patient uh, if the airbag did deploy and the patient came in contact with the airbag airbag, you should uh, always keep a high index of suspicion that they have some sort of face, head, and neck. Uh, injuries and be be on the lookout for that. Non-deployed airbags, uh, or while I'm still on that fact, I, I uh, when we were talking about airbag deployed airbags, my friend in elementary school, um, he disappeared from class for a couple weeks and nobody really knew where he was or what happened to him, and uh, just so happens he was sitting in the in the front seat uh, with his mom while they were driving. And uh, she was she got in a car accident and the airbag deployed. He went face first into the airbag and it tore open. Uh, it's kind of a freak thing. Usually that doesn't happen. It's extremely rare, but the airbag tore open and of course all of that superheated uh, that superheated gas came out onto his face and he had second and third degree burns all over his face and neck. So the airbag did save his life. Uh, because it reduced the force of that impact. However, when it tore open, that superheated gas did cause uh, him to have some severe injuries, and he ended up having to get some skin grafts and, and a couple surgeries. So uh, he ended up being okay, but uh, just goes to show that even though airbags are incredibly useful and, uh, and they save a lot of people's lives, they can still do a significant amount of damage. For us as providers, non-deployed airbags, uh, the reason they po pose a risk, um, even after the car is turned off, even after an accident, uh, sometimes the airbags will not deploy. It takes a certain amount of force to deploy the airbags. If they don't go off, uh, just turning off the car is not going to stop the uh, airbag from deploying. Okay? As long as the wires to the battery, the car's battery, are still connected, the airbag still has a chance of deploying. So what that means to us is you can find a couple different videos online uh, where it shows rescue teams or firefighters or EMS crews that are inside of the vehicle, the patient compartment or the passenger compartment of the vehicle, uh, you know, doing their job trying to extricate somebody and they've got their head inside of the vehicle where the, pass the, the driver is and boom, uh, the airbag goes off. In some cases, it might break your neck. In some cases, it might give you a skull fracture. This, those airbags deploy with a lot of force. Okay. Now we talk about this one, this point. Uh, use appropriate protective gear, such as uh, maybe a surgical mask, uh, some sort of face mask, or, um, or uh, eye protection. Um, these airbags, if you think about it, they're coated with uh, cornstarch or talc and it helps keep them helps keep the airbag from sticking to each other airbags are really really tightly folded and packed into that small little space inside of the steering wheel or inside of, inside of the dashboard uh, on the passenger side and um, you know hopefully you drive your car for 10 12 years however long you have it and hopefully they never have to deploy but they're kind of going off the basis of usually they sit there inert or not moving or not functioning these airbags for years and years and years. So when they do deploy, they have to be coated in these substances to make sure that the airbag hasn't melted together, especially in the high heat uh, of Arizona, um, that it doesn't stick together and that it deploys and inflates without any problems. Um, uh, so that's why... Um, they're coated in that substance. One of the best ways you can tell um, that an airbag has deployed, if you haven't noticed that the airbag is hanging outside of the uh, outside of the steering column, is the presence of this cornstarch and talc everywhere. It's going to be all over the place in the car, all over the patient, all over the seats, you name it. So 
uh, it's a good way to know if, a, if an airbag has in fact <coughs> deployed. Fundamentals of extrication. Extrication is removal from a trabin or a dangerous situation or position. You may provide uh, care as extrication goes on around you. Okay, This really uh, is one of the main functions of EMS. Uh, of course, we are talking about uh, in this chapter in the book how EMS functions um, uh, during a vehicle extrication or a special, special rescue. Okay, You have to obtain special uh, certifications. You have to obtain or go through special classes that teach you how to uh, uh, be a part of a special rescue or vehicle extrication. So EMS, EMS's main function really is to hang out on the uh, outskirts of the scene, kind of stay out of the way uh, until the fire crews that have been trained in extrication and uh, these special rescue situations have removed the patient. Uh, now they're ready for us. Okay, all we are doing, we're still providing medical care. Okay, that's it. We aren't assisting in the extrication. We're not going to just pick up one of the circle saws and start cutting the roof of the car off, right? We don't have the training to do that. We don't have the require the. Uh, we haven't satisfied the requirements to be able to use that equipment. Uh, so if you end up going through fire, uh, or if you end up going to fire, if you, if that's the route that you want to take. Of course, when you do your fire science classes, you're going to be trained on extrication. That's one of the things that the fire fire department does extremely well is extrication, especially from vehicles. So you will go through extensive training on how to approach different situations and how to use equipment that are specific to extrication itself. Right. So if you think about it in the terms of a call, extrication and medical care are two completely separate things. Okay. Most of the time, if we can avoid doing this point that I circled, providing care as extrication goes on around you, of course, that's much more dangerous for everybody involved. This might be this might be a critical care type situation where we need to establish an airway, start ventilating the patient while they are still trapped in the vehicle. Uh, then we might use this, but this is pretty rare. Um, this is not how we want to approach it. In best case scenario. We want to have two separate phases. We want to have the extrication phase where the patient is removed completely from the vehicle, okay, uh, and then brought over to us, and then we can start the second phase, which is patient assessment and patient care. So you have to think about it in terms of the book for National Registry that <clears throat> these are two separate functions and that you need special training for extrication uh, before you can actually be involved in the extrication part, okay. Entrapment is a condition in which a person is caught within a closed area with no way out or has a limb or other body, body part trapped. Uh, so a lot of the times with these nasty vehicle collisions or uh, accidents on the highway, um, a lot of times fire to, the fire department is going to be dispatched automatically just in case there is entrapment. Uh, but entrapment is one of those situations where you we literally, without... Um, we literally cannot remove that patient from the vehicle without using some form of complex uh, complex access. And we'll go over complex access. It basically means that you have to use tools, you have to use specialized equipment to remove the person from the vehicle. Um, so uh, this might be entrapment is a good, uh, the definition of entrapment is a good um, uh, example of why we might need to provide care as extrication goes on around us. Fundamentals of extrication. Uh, we will go over these 10 phases of extrication. Um, uh, in your book, they go over, go over them in detail and the slides, they kind of just touch on them. Uh, but we will, we will talk about all of the uh, specific important points that you need to know. Roles and responsibilities. EMS personnel are responsible for assessing and providing medical care, triaging and packaging patients, providing additional assessment and care as needed once the patient is removed, and providing transport to the ED. So really, this is no different um, than how we approach any other call. Okay? Of course, like I said, one of the main points of contention is right here. 
providing additional assessment and care as needed once the patient is removed. Okay, so like I said, uh, the book is teaching you from the standpoint that um, you, as the provider, are not trained in extrication, that you are there to um, complete that second phase of the call. Of course, the first phase is extrication, the removal of the patient by whatever means necessary. And then once the patient is remo removed by the rescue team, the EMS personnel are going to re be responsible for triage, assessment, packaging, and transport. The rescue team, which of course is different from uh, the medical team, the EMS team, uh, the rescue team is responsible for securing and stabilizing the vehicle, providing safe entrance and access to the patient, and extricating any patients that might be entrapped. Law enforcement is responsible for controlling traffic. This is huge at the scene of a motor vehicle collision. Massive. Okay, uh, if we were, um, you know, a lot of the times if we're talking about a crash on, in an intersection, which of course is extremely dangerous, dangerous because of the amount of variables, right, of how many cars can pass through there, people not paying attention to lights, people that are on their phones, texting, whatever, uh, a huge, huge uh, case for, um, for a uh, huge potential for um injuries or hazards uh, to the patient and the providers. Um, or if you're on a highway, if you're on the freeway and there's an accident, okay, of course you can't just magically stop traffic and all the cars disappear and nobody nobody comes that way anymore until the situation is re resolved. Or obviously it's just not practical. So having law enforcement uh, not to help with extrication not to help with medical care, but have a division of people that are solely, um, in my, in my mind, uh, law enforcement on the scene of uh, on the scene of these major accidents. They're almost the eyes and ears of the the providers and the extrication crew. Um, they, while we are focused on the patient, while we are focused on extrication, law enforcement can can be elsewhere on the scene. Managing personnel, they can, you know, be guiding the the flow of traffic and and help really keep that scene safe. So, um, law enforcement is going to be a huge tool uh, for us as we are dealing with these scenes to help maintain order at the scene and establish and maintain a perimeter, which gives us not only space to work, uh, but again, it gives us that kind of bubble of protection um, to help slow traffic down and help. Uh, beforehand um, or uh, uh, slow traffic down or or help uh, uh, motorists that are approaching that scene you know have a heads up with, of what's going going on so they can slow down and and everything can be safe as safe as it can uh, before approaching that scene where we are uh, very unprotected out in the elements um, uh, as as far as um, safety goes. So um, law enforcement is really going to help us a lot in that cause. Firefighters are responsible for extinguishing fire and uh, preventing ignition of a fire. Um, cars can go up really at any time, especially with the, the leaking of fluid. Ensuring scene safety and removing any spilled fuel. I'm sure you might have seen this happen once or twice. Um, uh, if you have driven by an accident that happened uh, fairly recently, um, a lot of the times if there's spilled, spilled fuel or leaking gasoline or what have you, uh, fire departments use, um, it's basically this super absorbent uh, kitty litter type stuff um, that they carry in bags on the, on the engine and they'll tear it open and then they'll just throw it all over the spilled fuel and it soaks all of it up it absorbs all of the all of the uh, fluid and uh, then they can just sweep up um, uh, that absorbent material and get rid of it and it kind of re extremely reduces the risk that um, that fuel is going to ignite or go up in flames uh, it's kind of the same stuff if you worked with chemicals like in a in a chemistry lab um, in college or high school they have to have it um, uh, they're required by law to have it in uh, 
in laboratories so that if you spill a chemical, they put the same stuff on it, it absorbs it, and then you just sweep it away. Preparation. Preparing for an incident requiring extrication involves training. Okay, rescue personnel must routinely check extrication tools in their response vehicles. If you ever get the chance to ride along with the fire department or if you go to paramedic school, you'll get uh, to do an internship where you actually function as a part of the crew for um, with a fire crew uh, for a while, maybe two or three months. Uh, you'll actually get to see this happen. And it's just the same as um, it's just the same as us on private ambulance where we have to go into every single every single day we go on shift. Uh, we need to meticulously check off what material we have, note any expiration dates. For me as a paramedic, I'll go through the entire drug box and look at all my medications, see if they're close to their expiration dates, uh, make sure that I have enough of what I need um, to make sure that once we go, um, uh, once we go in service for the day, that we are starting out with that we are starting out prepared. Uh, we never know what kind of calls we're going to get. We never know. We never know what kind of patients we're going to have. But we need to make sure that we have all the equipment available and ready, so that we are prepared for any type of situation that uh, that uh, might present itself that day. Same goes for these extrication crews, specifically fire, where they'll they'll do the same thing. They'll go through the drug box. They'll go through their medical equipment, but at the same time. Uh, they will go through uh, their checks for the engine itself and make sure that the pumps are working, make sure the lights and sirens are working. They'll make sure um, they'll pull out the saws, make sure they have enough oil. They'll run them for a little while to make sure that they're running the way that they need to. So they go through the same process to make sure, uh, even though they might not, they might go weeks on end without having to do an extrication. They're still going to check it every shift to make sure uh, that it's ready to go in the event that uh, they do get one of those calls, that shit. En route to the scene, procedures and safety pr precautions are similar to those in the phases of an ambulance call uh, when used to responding to a rescue incident. So really, this is your time to mentally prepare yourself. Um, like we've talked about before, um, the call starts as soon as you're dispatched. Okay, so using that dispatch information um, in this in this situation, they'll tell you where the accident is, so you can get a, um, a visual picture of where the accident might be, especially if you're familiar with the area, uh, uh, which you should be. Um, you can they might tell you how many cars are involved, how many patients preliminary pre preliminarily you might have based off of the caller's information they give dispatch. So you can start start uh, prepping up in your head. Um, you know, what might I see when I get there? If I do see this, what tools am I going to need? Um, if the patient presents with this, what kind of medical equipment am I going to need? Uh, so really, this is your chance to mentally prepare yourself and start going over what is required and what is expected of you for these different sort of different sorts of situations that might play out. Arrival and scene size up. Uh, position the ambulance to block the scene from oncoming traffic. Put on personal protective equipment and look for passing cars before exiting your vehicle. Make sure the scene is properly marked and protected. Of course, if I was in class, uh, if I was lecturing this in person, I would ask you guys uh, how you might do this. And your response would most likely be law enforcement. Okay, Law enforcement is going to help you with that. And of course, scene size up. Uh, the definition can be found on 1369, page 1369 of your book. Um, this is going to be on your exam, so make sure you know that. The definition of scene size up is the ongoing process of scene assessment to determine strategies and tactics to manage an emergency. Here, this picture isn't in uh, your slides. This is a slide that I added myself. Um, this is a good, um, this is a good uh, um, example of that first bullet point from the last slide where they talk about um, they talk about position the ambulance to help protect yourself. Uh, in this case, if you're working with a fire crew, of course, up here you can see the incident itself. Okay, and then right here, 
you can see the fire engine okay it's kind of parked at an angle uh, uh, in front of uh, the accident or the situation and the purpose of that is as you can see uh, traffic is flowing this way okay uh, traffic is moving towards the direction of, of the incident so we put the fire truck in front of the incident at that angle okay what that does is um, it gives us some space to work with it kind of helps control traffic of course you're going to want to request law enforcement on scene to help further facilitate um, these vehicles that are merging to avoid the incident but say this car didn't necessarily see what's going on or they weren't paying attention and that car is doing you know 45 50 60 miles an hour on the highway doesn't see what's going on uh, if we didn't have the fire engine there for protection, uh, that car has the potential to clear out or wipe out all of the providers on scene, hit the, the vehicle that is the point of incident itself, and cause a lot of damage um, and cause, uh, unfortunately, could cause death to providers and the patient. So that fire engine placed like this or positioned or staged like this uh, is important because it adds an element of protection. So that car going 40, you know, 50, 60 miles an hour hits that fire engine, that fire engine isn't going anywhere. The thing is huge, it's heavy, uh, uh, and of course, better, um, better we sustain 200 grand, 300 grand in damage to the fire engine than losing the life of a provider. So this is a good diagram of how we might protect the scene uh, from oncoming traffic. Arrival and scene size up, situational awareness is the ability to recognize uh, possible issues and act proactively to avoid a negative impact. I would know this point as well for the exam. Uh, definitely be able to describe the difference between size up and situational awareness. Uh, we should do a 360 degree walk around, which means before we start extrication, before we start medical care, uh, we should take the time to just do a 360 degree walk around the incident or the car itself um, just so that we can note um, any hazards. It'll give us a good idea of the mechanism of injury. Uh, it'll allow us to see how many patients there are, um, help us get a general impression of those patients. It might tell us if they're trapped or if there have been any ejected patients. The number of patients in the vehicle, vehicles involved, and any safety uh, concerns like leaking fluid, sharp objects, broken glass, all that kind of stuff can be noted by just taking a couple seconds, maybe a minute, to do that 360 degree walk around of, of the vehicle will give us a ton of information and, and really play a huge role in dictating how we approach uh, extrication and patient care for this situation. While looking at the vehicle, note any damage, uh, such as a bent steering wheel. Of course, if you see a bent steering wheel or uh, a damaged steering column, you should have a massive index of suspicion for chest and abdominal trauma. Imprints in the dashboard, uh, if the driver is unrestrained, of course, uh, uh, just like airbags, seat belts are designed uh, to slow the force of a deceleration injury and pre help prevent a secondary collision. Um, uh, so, of course, if they were unrestrained, that presents a, uh, a huge index of suspicion that the patient has sustained um, uh, or could have sustained an incredible force uh, from the impact uh, from not being restrained. Check windshield for a spiderweb pattern of shattered glass like we talked about in the trauma chapters. That starring of the windshield, as they like to say, um, could be a really good indicator of uh, head trauma that the patient's head struck. Uh, the windshield and of course most most of the time if you do see that it is coupled with unrestrained driver um, if they're not restrained by their seatbelt they could actually uh, due to the force of deceleration actually go up and over the steering column and their head can actually make contact with the steering or uh, excuse me the uh, windshield document all of your findings objectively and maintain a high index of suspicion for unseen uh, injuries evaluate the need for additional resources of course I don't have to state the importance of uh, this one, um, but uh, if 
you are the first on scene for this for this type of incident or some sort of um, significant crash or significant MOI, of course, you're going to want to have as many people on scene, uh, say fire for extrication purposes, uh, EMS for multiple patients after the rescue team uh, or after, after the extrication team has removed patients from the vehicle to care for those patients. And of course, law enforcement, like we talked about, uh, to help maintain order on the scene and facilitate um, uh, traffic control. Other potential hazards look for spilled fuel and other flammables, electric, uh, electrical short or damaged battery, rain, sleet, or snow, which of course can provide complications um, for ourselves. Uh, it also presents uh, the possibility that if the vehicle is unstable, it could actually start to slide or roll or move, which of course is very dangerous. Uh, crashes that occur on hills for the same reason. Uh, if the vehicle is unstable, it could actually start to move or roll, and the potential for violence on scene. Coordinate your efforts with rescue teams and law enforcement. Communicate with the rescue team or the, the extrication team, the people that are actually uh, uh, pulling um, uh, patients out of, the, uh, out of the wreckage. Communicate with the incident commander as soon as you arrive. This is something that we'll cover in the next chapter, the incident command system. Uh, so we'll learn about that in a little bit. Okay, but the incident commander basically is is the uh, the boss dog. Uh, he's uh, he or she is um, the uh, in command of the entire uh, scene or the entire incident. So they control um, a bunch of different aspects of how the uh, how the rescue process is actually conducted, uh, communication with the media, all that kind of stuff. So we'll talk about that in the next lecture. You may enter the vehicle to provide patient care when approved by the incident commander. Hazard control down electrical lines are a common hazard at uh, motor vehicle crashes. Never attempt to move them. Uh, Mari, uh, who is uh, one of the instructors here, or he's, he used to teach paramedic here. Um, he's a Mesa firefighter, and uh, he has plenty of pictures of people that have grabbed down power lines, and it burns them to a crisp as soon as they grab the, uh, uh, the power line. So um, there's a lot of electrical energy that's moving through these power lines. You are not trained, nor do you have the uh, specialized equipment to deal with down power lines. Um, so never approach, uh, basically if you see down power lines to you, that should signal that the scene is not safe. And of course we don't enter or mess with scenes that are not safe until we make them safe. And of course that requires, um, uh, gathering appropriate resources or requ requesting additional resources, um, in the form of fire can help out with this. Um, and um, every electrical company like SRP and APS, uh, they have was the 24-hour res emergency response crews, uh, say in the case of down power lines or some sort of electrical event, um, you can contact the power companies and they can send a crew out to shut the power down to the power lines. Fire can remove the power lines and proceed with extrication. Instruct the patient to remain in the vehicle until the power is shut off. Remain in the safe zone outside of the hot zone. Uh, we'll learn about the hot zone more. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the hot zone a little bit uh, later um, uh, in the upcoming chapters uh, when we start talking about uh, more hazmat type situations. Of course, as you can infer, I'm sure the safe zone is the area far enough away from the incident where you're not subjected to, say, like down power lines or, or um, uh, sharp metal, broken glass. Uh, and the hot zone is where you do have, um, there is a high risk of exposure to those sort of dangerous uh, objects or dangerous materials. Uh, when we're talking about hazmat, uh, of course, the hot zone is the epicenter of where that dangerous chemical or noxious gas or or fumes are released and same concept what they call the cold zone or the safe zone is far enough away where there's zero risk of exposure for those hazardous materials so we'll talk about these ideas a little bit more in the upcoming chapters 
Bystanders and family can create hazards. Of course, you can utilize law enforcement to help control these people on scene uh, and keep them away from any hazards or keep them away from where we're working so that they don't get in the way. We can do our jobs effectively. The vehicle can also be a hazard, uh, such as an unstable vehicle, maybe on its side or on its roof. Um, ensure that the car is in park with the parking brake set and the ignition turned off. This will greatly help any incidents, uh, any incidences that the, the car might start to roll forward. Alternative fuel vehicles powered by electricity uh, and electricity slash gasoline hybrids um, or fuels such as propane, natural gas, methanol, or hydrogen. Um, uh, of course, you there's a there's a, a high risk of combustion. Okay, of course, just like any other car, uh, these patient or these cars might actually um, uh, ignite after an accident, depending on how severe the damage is. Uh, so, of course, uh, a huge priority with any vehicle, uh, whether it's a hybrid vehicle or alternative fuel vehicle or just a run-of-the-mill gasoline vehicle, um, all of them require uh, a battery system. Uh, and of course, like we talked about already, airbag deployment is directly related to that battery connection. So one of the first things that um, extrication crews will do, even if the airbags have deployed, they'll actually go find the battery and they'll cut the wires to the to the battery by severing that connection that means that you have now turned off all of the electrical components of the car um, uh, what you need to be aware of is that with alternative fuel and hybrid vehicles like the prius i use the prius as an example because i know for sure they don't have one or two they have six uh, lithium-ion batteries that help power the car um, so uh, a lot of firefighters, fire departments, they have manuals for these different types of vehicles, you know, so that they're properly trained on whatever vehicle they might run into. But especially these alternative fuel or hybrid vehicles, a lot of the, a lot of times they have more than, than one battery, like the Prius has six. So with, armed with that knowledge, um, it is extremely important for extrication crews to find and locate any batteries and sever the connection between the car and the batteries. Support operations include lighting at the scene, establishing tool and equipment staging areas, marking helicopter landing zones. We're going to talk about this in transport operations, um, uh, which is chapter 36, um, which, uh, of course, we've already covered uh, in class. So um, I guess I can say a few words about it. Um, the marking of the helicopter landing zones, of course, we want to make sure as a refresher that um, these landing zones are, are far enough away from the scene that it won't really disturb the scene. We want to make sure that it's on a uh, hard, flat surface or to the best of, of our ability as we can. And of course, the minimum recommendations for a landing zone is 60 by 60 feet and uh, uh, the recommended uh, dimensions for a landing zone are 100 by 100 feet. So uh, these support operations are important. Say we do have to request a helicopter um, for a critical patient that we need to get to, say a trauma center that's that's far away, or these patients are really time dependent uh, as far as their prognosis goes or their outcome goes. Uh, we need these support operations to help effectively uh, set up a landing zone for the helicopter to facilitate that transport of the patient. Fire and rescue personnel will work together on these functions. Gaining access, of course, is a huge uh, part of extrication. Okay? The entire purpose of an extrication is to gain access to the patient, to get to the patient and effectively remove them. Um, ensure the vehicle is stable and that hazards are eliminated or controlled. Of course, these are things we should have identified either from our general impression or our 360 degree walk around. Uh, method to gain access depends on the situation. A lot of the times, um, uh, it depends on, um, it could end up depend, uh, depending on uh, the terrain, uh, the how stable the vehicle is, um, weather conditions, 
um, <clears throat> a whole bunch of different factors. Considerations. Is the patient in a vehicle or other structure? Is the vehicle or structure significantly damaged? Or if it is damaged, how significant is the damage? Uh, are there hazards present? Uh, vehicle position. On what type of surface is the vehicle? Is it apt to roll or tip? Um, of course, all of these considerations, like we just talked about in the last uh, uh, in the last slide, are all going to uh, dip, are all going to play a role in uh, how difficult it is to extricate a patient. Not only that, but uh, by what methods or by what tools are we going to need to extricate the patient? Rapid extrication may be needed to remove a patient who needs resuscitation. Okay, uh, we will talk about um, uh, rapid extrication when you guys come back from break. Uh, we'll actually, <coughs> excuse me, we'll actually show you uh, how a rapid extrication is done from a vehicle. It's basically the process of quickly uh, removing a patient while doing our best to protect their spine, uh, but to get them out of the vehicle and away from the, the situation where we can effectively assess them, package them, treat them, and then uh, get them to the hospital as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, keep the patient safe. A heavy, non-flammable blanket can protect from flying glass or other objects. A lot of times you'll see this. Um, a lot of times you'll see this in uh, extrication situations where uh, the patient is still in the car, but they may need to uh, cut the A, B, and C post of the car to remove uh, the roof of the car. Um, so placing a blanket over the patient, of course, there's going to be a lot of sparks and flying glass and all that kind of stuff. So it could be just a simple measure we can take to uh, protect them. Talk to the patient and explain what is happening. Of course, uh, patients are going to be confused. They may be altered. They, they're going to be scared and anxious. So the best that we can do to keep them informed on how the extrication is going, what we need to do next, and what we're going to do for them um, uh, is extremely important. Simple access. Okay, you need to know the difference between simple and complex access for the exam. Uh, and it's pretty easy. Simple access is access to the patient without using any tools or breaking any glass. Right. Um, the fire department has a, um, they have a uh, saying that they use, uh, try before you pry, right? A lot of times firefighters, uh, uh, of course, get, get hyped up in, in, uh, in situations where they might think that they get to use their tools or, or bust out their equipment, which, um, of course, is, is, is cool for them. I would be excited to use all that stuff, too, but... Um, a lot of times they might get a little, a little overzealous or they might get um, too, uh, too um, excited about using uh, their extrication equipment that they forget that, you know, if they just tried the door, if they just tried opening the door, they might gain access to the patient uh, instead of breaking out all these tools. Because as soon as you use tools, you increase the risk of injury and damage to the patient and the provider. So. Uh, we always try simple access before complex access. If we can just open the door without using tools or breaking glass uh, to get to the patient, of course, that uh, is going to be very beneficial. Try all door handles or roll down the windows before using complex access. And of course, in contrast to complex access um, or simple access, complex access requires special tools to um, get to the patient. Okay, it could be um, hand pneumatic or hydraulic rescue tools like uh, the jaws of life, like you can see in this picture right here. Okay, uh, used to basically make an accordion out of the door and and, uh, and uh, rip the door off of uh, uh, the passenger or the driver side to gain access to the patient. It might be circle saws, it might be chainsaws, it might be drills. Um, anything that requires breaking glass or tools to get to the patient is regarded as complex access. Okay, emergency care. Of course, this is where uh, we, we really start to come into play. Perform a primary assessment and provide care before further extrication. Provide manual stabilization to the spine. Okay, 
um, just like I said, when we when you guys come back from break, we'll we'll teach you a little bit about rapid extrication, and you'll see these elements actually start to come into play. Uh, where if we're dealing with the driver of a vehicle, we can have a provider go into uh, if it's a four door, say a sedan or a truck, we can have somebody go into uh, the back of the vehicle and hold manual stabilization from behind the patient. Of course, we're going to open the airway and clear it of secretions, if any, provide high flow oxygen and uh, uh, ventilation if needed, control any significant external bleeding. Of course, the uh, hemorrhage, external hemorrhage is going to take precedence over the airway. Uh, treat all critical injuries. You guys know the, the life threatening injuries. Um, uh, by now and how to treat them. So definitely look out for those. Um, address life-threatening external hemorrhage before airway and breathing, just like we talked about. Removal of the patient. Uh, coordinate with the rescue personnel to determine the best removal route. Uh, determine the urgency of extrication. Determine the position to best protect the patient and determine how you will move the patient. Okay, of course, uh, uh, with uh, all three of these points, you're going to have to uh, enlist the help and communicate with the extrication team, okay? Because they're going to give you some really good insight, and you guys, uh, both the rescue team and the uh, EMS team, are going to be able to coordinate with each other and best determine all three of these points. Your input is essential so that the patient is protected from further harm, right? Uh, and knowledge of uh, uh, and bringing up critical injuries that we might have seen from our general impression of the patient to the rescue team so that they are also made aware of uh, these critical injuries and that could in fact play a role of uh, like I said the urgency of the extrication how they actually go about extrication so uh, input from both sides of the equation is incredibly important um, Often you will be placed in the vehicle with the patient. Be sure to wear uh, proper PPE. Transfer the patient. Once the patient is free, perform a primary assessment. Ensure that the spine is manually stabilized. Move the patient in a series of controlled steps. All of this we have practiced with the um, all of this we have practiced with the C spine station. So this should be nothing new. Uh, things like you only want to move the patient one step at a time, always at the head's count of three. The person holding C-spine is always in control. They're responsible for uh, making sure that each crew member knows exactly where and how far the patient is moving uh, and on what count, usually the three count. Now, I'll give you guys about 20 seconds to look at this picture and tell me, uh, uh, tell me, um, there's something in this picture that makes me very angry, uh, and I hate seeing this picture. It makes me really mad that they carried it over to the 11th edition, um, but there's something about this picture that really grinds my gears. I'll give you guys 20 seconds to see if you can figure it out. Did you guys get it? The reason this picture makes me so mad is right here. If you notice on the C collar, the cervical collar, the chin strap portion is not folded out. That is <laughs> spinal stabilization 101. Uh, <laughs> every time you break a C collar out, you have to first make sure that the chin strap is, is folded out. It doesn't fit on the patient correctly. It could be way more uncomfortable for the patient. And of course, now that open area in the front of the cervical collar, which would allow us to visualize or gain access to the patient's trachea and uh, um, carotid arteries, jugular veins, that has now been obstructed from view because the chin strap isn't folded out. Uh, so <clears throat> this picture makes me laugh and it also makes me angry at the same time. So. Uh, you guys know better than that. Make sure that you apply the C collar properly. Termination. Termination involves uh, returning emergency units to service. 
All equipment used on the scene must be checked. Uh, uh, clean, check and clean the ambulance replacing used supplies and complete all necessary reports. Specialized rescue situations. Uh, sometimes a patient can only be reached by special teams. Um, specialized team skills include cave rescue, combined space rescue, cross field and tra trail rescue, and dive rescue. Um, Uh, some other, <clears throat> excuse me, examples of specialized rescue situations, mine rescue, missing person search and rescue, mountain rock and ice climbing rescues, um, uh, ski or snow rescue, structural collapse, SWAT teams, um, uh, technical rope rescue, trench rescue, water and small craft rescue, whitewater rescue. Uh, the book will give you... Uh, the book will give you uh, some uh, some more insight as to how these are conducted or what they might look like. So you can definitely uh, read up on those in the book if you are um, if you are uh, interested in them, uh, or you can do some Google research if you're if this is something tech uh, specifically that uh, or something <clears throat> one of, if you wanted to be involved in some sort of special rescue some point in your career. You can definitely look into that. These are all really cool types of specialized rescue that require um, specific training um, and knowledge. <coughs> excuse me, knowledge and tools. Uh, so these are all really cool types of rescue. We'll only talk about uh, for the rest of the lecture. We'll go over go over some specific. Um, uh, We'll go over some specific types of special rescues, and those will be on the exam. But for these, they kind of just give you an overview of, uh, or give you an idea of how many different types of special rescue there are. Technical rescue situation. Um, personnel need specialized training and equipment. Of course, it's unsafe for, unsafe for untrained personnel. At this point, if you don't have the training for the tools or the equipment, you're almost in essence like a bystander and we already know it, uh, up until this point how uh, being a bystander on the scene of an incident is dangerous so you're more of a danger and a hindrance than you are of help um, of course and that's outside of being a medical provider and assessing packaging and treating patients once they are rescued or removed from these situations many technical rescue team members are also EMTs Ensure the technical rescue team has been summoned. When you arrive, you will be directed or led to the staging area. This is where you set up your equipment uh, at the staging area, and you basically just wait until somebody uh, higher ranking than you determines that your your special your specialty or your knowledge or your skill set is required, and then they will further send you uh, exactly where you need to go and tell you what you need to do. Uh, perform assessment and initiate care as soon as the rescue team brings the patient to you. Okay, so once again, the two phases of extrication, the actual extrication process itself to remove the patient, which does not require medical care, and then once they are removed, they're brought to us, uh, and then that is where our job stop starts when the rescue team brings the patient to us. Okay, that's where our job begins and uh, the EMS portion of the call goes into effect. Packaging and carrying the patient back to the ambulance requires a joint uh, effort. Search and rescue. An ambulance is usually summoned to the command post when a person is lost outdoors and a search effort is initiated. Your role is to stand by the command post until the person or persons are found. Okay. Once the missing person is found, you will be guided by uh, search personnel to the location where you can begin treatment. You may need to relocate the ambulance or use an all-terrain vehicle. When you're following along in your lecture slide, um, they make a point to say, set your radio to a discrete volume. Uh, this is important because sometimes as EMS personnel, you might actually be asked to stay with the family as they're waiting, um, as they're waiting for their loved one who has been lost um, or is missing uh, while the rescue team actually goes out the search and rescue team to find this person. 
Um, so you set your radio at, at a discrete volume um, because uh, only the incident commander is has the responsibility of communicating the progress or the findings of the search and rescue efforts to the family and to the media. So um, uh, if we are asked to stay with the family, set your radio at a discrete volume uh, because, of course, you don't want to be standing with the family and somebody comes over the radio and is like, oh, hey, we found the person, they're dead. Right. You don't want to deal with that situation. That's not how the family wants to find out about that uh, very sensitive issue. So uh, remember that the incident commander is the only person that is going to um, that is going to relay that information. So keep your radio at a discrete volume. Trench rescue. Many cave ins and trench collapses uh, have poor outcomes for victims. A lot of the time or. Uh, a uh, couple times throughout the years, I've heard of, uh, especially places like in Florida where sinkholes develop. I remember the last one I heard about was a couple of years ago. Some guy that was just uh, in his house in Florida taking a nap on his bed, and then this huge sinkhole opened up underneath his house and uh, basically swallowed him and his house whole. And it took them a couple of weeks to dig through the dig through the collapse and actually get him out of there. Of course, he was dead by the time they got him out. But um, um, these sinkholes develop because of underground aquifers that hold water. If they drain, it basically just leaves this huge unstable cavity underneath the ground that is subject to uh, cave in and fall, uh, fall in. So um, uh, Collapses usually involve large areas of falling dirt. Okay, um, I will ask you guys to refer to, let's see, page 1378, when it talks about uh, trench rescues. Um, there is a, uh, there's a point in there where it says collapses usually involve large areas of falling dirt that weigh approximately 100 pounds per cubic foot. That's a lot of weight. That's a lot of dirt that's being uh, uh, compounded on top of the patient that falls into a trench. Uh, so, of course, as you might uh, be able to infer on your own, once that amount of dirt actually uh, falls on top of the patient, that's extremely heavy. Uh, they're not going to be able to expand their chest wall. They're going to suffocate and eventually die. Uh, but that is on the exam, so I would uh, I would make sure that you know that 1378 under trench rescue, 100 pounds per cubic foot. Risk of secondary collapse is a concern. Park uh, response vehicles at least 500 feet away from the scene. This is also on your exam, so I would make sure you know that. The reason is we don't know we don't necessarily know how unstable the surrounding ground is. Okay, so. We can look at a scene for a trench for a collapse or a trench collapse and see the epicenter and know that of course that area is unstable so we want to make sure we're at least 500 feet away from the epicenter from the scene uh, just to make sure that we we are outside of that that danger zone so that we don't run a risk of a secondary collapse i've seen videos of uh, where they uh, a sinkhole caved in and then the, they bring in like a a crane or something, uh, some sort of uh, vehicle, specialized vehicle to pull somebody out of there by dropping a line into the sinkhole, but they get a little too close and there's no proper shoring in place. And um, there, there is actually a secondary cave in where the crane actually falls into the sinkhole as well. Uh, so we want to make sure that doesn't happen to us. All vehicles should be turned off. Uh, road traffic should be diverted from the area. Construction equipment may be unstable and could fall into the cave in or trench, just like we talked about. Do not enter a trench without proper shoring in place. Shoring is basically using equipment and extra soil to build up uh, the side or the walls of the trench um, uh, so that it doesn't um, so that it doesn't uh, so that we can reduce the risk of that secondary uh, cave-in. Uh, so proper shoring just helps build up the walls of the trench uh, or the outskirts of the trench to help reduce the risk that any more 
uh, dirt or debris actually caves in and makes the situation even worse. During extrication, medical personnel trained in cave-in and trench collapse will provide most medical care. Be prepared to receive patients after the extrication, just like vehicle extrication. Tactical emergency medical support. Law enforcement personnel usually ensure scene safety. Sometimes a special weapons and tactics or a SWAT team is needed to secure an area. Okay. When called to the scene, report to the incident commander. Lights and sirens should be turned off. A lot of the times now, communities are even uh, training and incorporating nurses, paramedics, uh, EMTs, and, and even physicians into uh, the SWAT team. Uh, so a lot of the times, they might actually have a provider that's, that's specifically trained in both uh, medical care and, uh, and SWAT tactics or law enforcement tactic, tactics uh, that will actually go in uh, with um, with the SWAT team and be there first on scene uh, with the SWAT team um, so that they can provide and package the patient and remove them in situations under fire. Of course, uh, we are not trained to do that. So really, we're going to report to the incident commander they're going to stage us and basically just like extrication, just like special rescue, um, they're going to remove those patients given to us so that we can uh, now provide other emergency care. Some things that we can do in the meantime is um, uh, if the incident commander tasks us with it, we can be preparing for the call mentally and getting some equipment out. We can be setting up a, a landing zone, say that if we need a helicopter to come on scene to take the patient away. Uh, so there are some other things that we could do in the meantime. We're just not going to go into the actual scene uh, because it is it it is extremely unsafe. Of course, if the SWAT team needs to be there, um, we're going to wait for them to bring the patient to us, and then we're going to start our assessment and care um, during that time. Structure fires in most areas, an ambulance is dispatched with the fire department to a structure fire. Ask the incident commander where the ambulance should be staged. Search and rescue in a burning building requires special training and equipment, uh, and it, of course, is going to be handled by the fire department. Sometimes a scene may be further complicated by hazardous materials.